Welcome to another episode of the Prince Virus Decode, where we bring experts from across the country to answer all of your COVID questions. Yesterday on the print, we brought some cautious good news. Uh, that is the R value, an indicator of how fast the infection is spreading, has reduced to 1.30 from nearly three around mid-January. That is the drop in that is a drop in the rate of uh, how uh, fast the infections are growing, but active cases are still increasing on the whole. Uh, on the other hand, cities like Delhi and Kolkata now have are below one, which means that active cases there are actually falling. What does this mean for the pandemic? Is this wave over for cities? And are we seeing more spread in rural areas now? These are some of the questions that we hope we'll uh, get some answers to. We have uh, with us today on our panel, Dr. Shashank Joshi, member of uh, Maharashtra COVID Task Force, and Dr. Amrish Mittal, chairperson and head of endocrinology and diabetes division in Max Healthcare. We also have about Abhantika Ghosh, uh, who tracks health for the print. I would like to uh, remind our viewers to please send in all your questions and I will try to take up as many as possible through the course of this episode. Uh, before going to the audience questions, uh, Dr. Mittal, uh, can you tell us what it is like in Delhi hospitals right now? Are cases of COVID coming down? Uh, thank you, Mohana, for having me here. Uh, yes, uh, uh, very cautiously, I would say that cases are definitely coming down. New cases coming for hospitalization has dramatically dropped in the last few days. And we are hoping it will continue at this pace, uh, you know, to drop at this pace. The numbers in hospitals, like, for example, from a peak of whatever, you know, a few days ago, we are down to half of our peak in Max Arcade. I just checked the data right before coming for this interview. Uh, so the overall numbers have gone down and whatever is there are the more serious patients who are continuing to stay in the hospital after the initial admissions for whatever reason. And that's a different story. We can discuss who are these serious cases. But the fact is that fresh admissions are happening, of course, but the numbers are clearly going down. So to me, it's not one day now, it's been a few days and I, I do see this as a very positive sign. And I see that at least this particular wave that, that is now surging across the country, as far as Delhi is concerned, and I know about Bombay also, but Shashank will know much more about that, is that it is showing a decline. So the pressure on the hospitals is not right now being felt that much. Right, that's that's actually excellent to hear. I mean, uh, we did have a huge scare when you know the number of cases shot up like it had, but uh, it did not translate into as many hospitalizations, thankfully. Um, Dr. Mitha, uh, no, I'm sorry, Dr. Joshi. Uh, now that you know, um, now that we are here, we've heard about the numbers from Delhi. Can you give us some insights into what the situation is? in Maharashtra, and especially, uh, you know, in the rural districts? So Maharashtra, as Abhiji said, as far as Mumbai is concerned, we are on a, we had a rapid explosive rise, and then we had a flat curve, and now we are getting a rapid decline. I mean, our cases are all now around 2,000, 3,000, though absolute numbers don't matter. And 80 to 90% of our hospital beds, oxygen beds are empty. Let me underline the fact, whatever is marked for COVID is empty. Our jumbo facilities are there. A Pune number is Pune is at its peak right now as we speak. Nasik is at its peak. So a lot of uh, other metros are at their peak right now. They are reporting 16,000, 18,000 numbers, absolute numbers. But absolute numbers don't count with the changing strategic testing. That really doesn't count. Uh, rural India is still not hit the peak. It's like starting to pick up now. So as far as Maharashtra is concerned, it's a very skewed pattern. And this is what we are going to see throughout this uh, third Omicron wave. We are going to see the large metros like Mumbai, Delhi, Calcutta coming out of it. Uh, we are going to see the neighboring regions, like just like you have NCR in Delhi, we have MMR in Mumbai. That's where now the peak has moved. And then it will move into the hinterland. So it, it will go phase-wise. And the only thing is that in the past, we were able to calculate it. And there was a gap, like say Mumbai, Delhi had a gap of say, Two weeks. That gap with this Omicron narrowed, you know, within four to five days. In fact, I used to talk to Abhiji 
He's a good friend of mine for the last 30 years, a mentee to many of us. And, you know, he used to know exactly that when I tell him and send him a signal, uh, Delhi has to be ready in 10 to 15 days. This time it happened in four to five days. And, right. you know, this was the difference because of Omicron. And that's clearly the dominant uh, strain. Maharashtra has one problem, uh, which is that uh, we were having a thick tail of Delta and Delta derivatives. And it mm -hmm. still remains there, like Kerala, Maharashtra, northeast of India and some parts of southern India. They still have that sticky Delta or Delta derivatives in the genomic sampling. And that's really the concern because that still is a little more sinister variant. Clearly, it's a more sinister variant compared to the Omicron strain. Mumbai data is out now. It's around 88% uh, is, is, is uh, Omicron and rest of it is the Delta derivatives. We still have around a few number of cases which are neither Delta nor Omicron. They are still having Kappa, which is a, which are variants of interest. So it's it's a little different than North India. Actually, what had happened is the second wave had completely gone. So it mm -hmm. was like a virgin field Omicron got, and which is why the predominant strain which blasted out was Omicron, which is why Delhi went up steep and came down steep. So in Maharashtra, we'll see this is like a cyclone, which is now, and the clouds were over Mumbai. They have receded and they have gone to MMR and now they are going to the hinterland. That is how I can I, you can look at it. So clearly, it will go there. Another two to four weeks. So Maharashtra peak should be somewhere around first week of February. And, uh, you know, by 15th of February, probably the hinterland will have its peak is, is, the, is the feeling we have. But all these things will be a little uh, advanced by maybe five to seven days, and which is fine. But as I said, the, as long as the healthcare infrastructure is not burdened, our numbers are clearly hospitalizations due to COVID. Mm -hmm. We have hospitalizations with COVID. Then we have oxygenation. Then we have ventilator. Then we have deaths. Current right. deaths are predominantly occurring in people with COVID, with serious comorbid diseases, with serious 18 to 90 percent of our deaths, which are occurring, and we are having deaths. It's not that we don't have deaths. They are in serious. So they are COPDs who have got exacerbation. The other problem which has occurred now are two. One is that we had a dust storm, which is pretty bad. And uh, we had uh, a bad chilly winter, including places where there were rain, uh, freak weather and a little bit of hail, uh, snow like hail, which never is seen in Maharashtra. And definitely it has impacted and there is a tsunami of flu-like syndrome. So, you know, every COVID uh, is, is uh, you know, for every COVID, we are also getting flu-like syndrome and respiratory viruses are at its peak. Normally, we are not used to this type of a chill. Mm -hmm. uh, Amriji was surprised in the morning once he asked me, Ki, you know, at 16 and 15 and 12 degrees, why are you feeling cold? <laughs> I told him it is a chill, wind chill. So when we are all across the sea, the wind chill really is, is, is the one which is affecting. And it's also responsible for, to some extent, a bad sore throat. So obviously, symptomatic testing is a little more than what you anticipate. And uh, that's something which is happening. So this is where we are in Maharashtra. We probably in Dubai, we are clearly seeing a decline. Some other regions, we are starting seeing a decline. Rest of the region is in peak. Rural India probably in Maharashtra at least will come in another seven to ten days from now. Uh, one, I have one question. Moon, I, I can just come in. Uh, when we talk about you know the numbers going up and numbers coming down, in the interim there was also a change in testing strategy. Uh, is there any way these graphs are factoring that in, or at this stage of the pandemic, do you think it's just not important whether we factor that in? So if you ask my take on it, I don't think it is going to matter now. So absolute numbers really don't matter. We look at test positivity rate. Actually, with the changing of strategy, the TPR, we were anticipating it to go up. Yeah. And it actually didn't happen because the decline was very steep. So when the decline is very steep, you know, we, we, we did get a spot in between, you know, one or two days on a Wednesday, we got a spot and, you know, Twitter trolled me also for that, that, you know, I, I predicted something and it didn't happen. Because it's like, you know, COVID's one thing we know for COVID is it's still predictably unpredictable. You know, and that's the only thing which I can say for sure, that it, it always tries to keep on having these googlies which come in. But clearly, Abhantika, it's a very good question which you ask, that we still uh, are clearly seeing a decline. And, then, and Mumbai, Delhi is almost, <clears throat> almost in a decon. You know, I mean, I mean, it's like virtually within four days after Mumbai started seeing its decline, you are seeing the flattening happening in Delhi. And now we are seeing a decline happening in Delhi. So it's like virtually, and, and both the cities can't go completely wrong. 
you know so so you see we are looking at that uh, we we do have uh, similar data from bengal i'm told it's equally bad but we don't know the type of testing which is happening there completely in right. public domain but i think it is also very similar if you ask me so 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 I, maybe amrish has a point on this but i think that i we, think i don't have to go by those numbers too much i think it's the hospitalization numbers which matter and the mortality mm -hmm. which matters yeah right so quite clearly uh, the testing strategy has rendered the numbers total numbers superfluous to some extent it is not just the testing strategy it's also the fact that a lot of people after having realized that omicron is not a serious condition just don't test at all they go around with a cough and cold and you know they just don't test at all so that's a large number and at least in delhi and probably in bombay also the use of home rapid antigen kits has really gone up as the icmr uh, made a statement that day i think the dg icmr made a statement that uh, they sort of done 2 lakh uh, have been sold in january itself That's which true. is very really much so that all those factors so we're not looking at absolute numbers to be very honest you know we're not getting excited by the increase or decrease but the positivity rate is a much better indicator if you're testing predominantly symptomatic people you should probably get a higher positivity rate you know but that is coming down plus right. you know on the ground you talk to all your colleagues in all the hospitals quite clearly i mean the numbers are coming down they're just not getting that many patients for admission and and in 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 our hospital for example if you look at the patients who are sick or serious or even the ones who died actually came with very serious disease some of them were just found to be positive here you know advanced cancer advanced kidney disease stroke heart attacks so which of course we cannot say that covid did not influence that but they were just found to be positive on day 2 day 3 of admission or something and you know you so they get labeled as 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 uh, as covid an extreme example let me give you hypothetical example someone has a road accident road traffic accident uh, has a major head injury is wheeled into the hospital and then a covid test is mandatory and you find the person is positive the person has to go to the covid ward because he is covid positive so he gets labeled as a covid sort of patient you know so what i'm saying is that not all of course there are some patients who got sick because of covid no question about that but a fairly high proportion is also of those who were just found to have covid where covid could have played some role minor role or no role at all so that gives us a lot of confidence you know one is the data that's coming out being uh, collated daily and put out put together but you know on the ground you know that the lngp uh, chief also said that while deaths continue to be there the overall deaths have not increased in the hospital so you know maybe many of the people who are unfortunately dying would have probably succumbed to their accompanying illness or their underlying illness so that is a thing it's not absolute so don't uh, for a moment think that i'm saying that it is not causing serious disease but it is not common at all to get serious disease due to omicron per se that's not common so that's why people are you know just i mean other way around of course people have become so careless that's another story uh, no one's willing to do the isolation period for five days i mean it's it's very difficult to explain to people because they're feeling fine and you know kuch hota to hai nahi so people just you know are spreading the the bug like anything all right um so i have so um uh, you know audience questions coming in abundika i'll come to you uh so raj is asking is omicron detected with just the s gene dropout indication or are there more confirmatory tests i think dr joshi is a better person to answer that question so clearly uh, s gene dropout can be very tricky uh first of all s gene dropout is also seen in the alpha variant which was seen in delhi uh, in the second wave second thing is that predominant omicron there are three variants sub lineages of omicron uh, ba1 ba2 and ba3 so the ba1 and ba3 uh, which is around 50 to 60% of omicron have as gene dropout but the ba2 can have as gene presence so don't get carried away yes it does if it is absent it tells you that it is omicron for sure if it is present it could be a ba2 variant or it could be a delta so both these things are there and then you need to wait for a genomic testing which takes a long time so two things uh, as as doctors we have to do see we we can't uh, lose our patients lives for us this current covid wave the most important thing is save every life 
So if we suspect a delta and if we see the Omicron virus is a nose and throat COVID. So it is the upper airway COVID. So if we get lung involvement, you know, we have to treat it like a delta, <clears throat> treat with the same vigor, treat with the critical care intensity and monitor the patient more aggressively. So that is how our treatment approach changes. And yes, if the S-gene deletion is present, Omicron, if it is, uh, if it is absent, it is Omicron. If it is present, however, it could be Delta, it could be BA2. And BA2 is the new hot buzzword now. Because right. if you look at Netherlands, if you look at Denmark, if you look at United Kingdom, mm. people are getting this again and again infection with the BA2 coming up. And mm. as I said, the unpredictability of COVID continues. So we don't know the sublineages well here. Uh, Calcutta, they called it as a sleeth variant. You know, the ICMR called it as a sleeth variant. 80% was the, uh, the BA2. So right. I think the last word on this is not out. And right. I still think that if the S gene is deleted, Omicron for sure, it's BA1, BA3. Mild disease, recovery is usually the rule and not an exception unless and until you have a serious comorbidity. And if it is a S gene is present, be very vigilant and save that life. Keep the patient in the hospital setup under experts. Right. So, you know, uh, a so follow up to that, I would like again, to go sorry. to. Yeah, yeah. Continue. But I was just saying that uh, just to add to one sentence to what Shashank has already so nicely explained is the fact that BA2 hit India at the same time almost. You know, in other countries, it was just the regular Omicron and then the BO2 got recognized. Here, right from the beginning, as the genomics started, we started picking up BA2. If you speak to the IGIB people, they were picking up BA2 right from the beginning. So probably it's come on together. So we cannot use as gene dropout very as a very major sort of uh, diagnostic strategy in India at the moment. And right. of course, if you want to go further, you have to do genome testing, but that's that takes several days. Right. So, uh, you know, there were like, uh, there are several kits that were uh, rolled out for this uh, S gene dropout test to sort of screen for Omicron. So I just wanted to follow up on this, you know, discussion uh, with you, um, with this question that uh, is the diagnosis, is this treatment different for those who are uh, infected with Omicron? Is there some sort of a screening going on to detect uh, or to differentiate these patients from those who are being infected with Delta? And does the treatment then differ? So let me be very transparent here. I think it is, we have to treat it as COVID. We can't treat it as a Omicron. Predominantly it is Omicron. So if you see nasal symptoms, very bad sore throat, headache, backache, you know, and presence of, uh, you know, smell and taste. The likelihood of upper airway is Omicron. If you have a lack of smell and taste, uh, you have shortness of breath, uh, you have a desaturation, you have a lung involvement, the likelihood of it being Delta cannot be ruled out in geographies like say in Mumbai or, or Maharashtra or maybe in Tamil Nadu or maybe in Northeast, but may not be in Delhi because I, I think that Delhi, it is overwhelming data that 95% plus is Omicron. So that is how we, we have to, but we have to be vigilant. We can't be, so the treatment but you know, is Shishan, symptomatic please. in the upper airways. As far as the lower airways are concerned, obviously it is inside the hospital. It is oxygen and prone position and if needed steroids, if there's a desaturation. So that protocol has not changed. You are still treating COVID as a disease and you're trying to save lives. Amri had a point. Go ahead. No, I was just saying that the moment there's lung involvement, all discrimination, I mean, all the distinctions end. It is with lung involvement, without lung involvement. Absolutely. So if it's without lung involvement, you treat as Omicron. The moment lung oxygen drop, breathlessness, anything, it goes the other way. 90%, even 95% may be Omicron. But as treating doctors, we're worried about 5% also. We can't afford to lose a patient simply because everyone is getting Omicron, but this particular guy got Delta, you know. So if there is any sign of oxygen drop, which I make all my patients monitor three times a day, even if they are having typical Omicron, if there's any sign of breathlessness, any pneumonia type of signs, that means something more is happening rather than at that point figure out whether it's Omicron or Delta, you go down the lung path and you treat with the whole gamut of uh, treatments available to you. So no risk there. Right, right. Uh, Omantika, coming to you with uh, this question on, you know, like we do, uh, we, we, we are talking about Omicron, obviously, because it, it's uh, widespread. We, in the past, saw how, you know, Delta caused the last. But uh, 
we, we seem to always pick up infections or uh, pick up these variants or know about these variants once it has been detected outside india does india itself have uh, you know the 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 correct infrastructure the mechanism to sort of detect and report new variants so um this has this has been a concern right from the beginning uh, so if if we take this morning's figures um so we have close to 4 crore cases total cases and the last bulletin of uh, the insacog that talked of 1.28 lakh uh, genomes having been sequenced so we are doing what we call sentinel surveillance um i think i'm not sure the experts on the panel may have uh, i mean may, may know better but i think that's really very little to be picking up anything i mean if we pick up a new variant that would more be a fortunate circumstance rather than anything else because our omicron numbers as has been constantly flagged time and again that these numbers really mean nothing because i can understand we can't detect all of them but if we don't even have an undercounting factor if we don't have an estimate that how much are we undercounting then merely extrapolating south african data to say omicron is mild i don't think is scientifically sound so right. um uh, the genome sequencing the the sort of the pace of genome sequencing the lack of adequate sequencing has been flagged many times and um yes it is correct that it does not matter to the individual patient it's on the doctor's clinical uh, sort of judgment what to do what not to do it does not matter to me whether i am omicron or delta but it does matter to a country's understanding of the disease a country's assessment of the disease uh whether this many people are delta or omicron or something else and i think leave alone a new variant i think we are not even doing enough to detect the ones that are currently circulating for example somebody actually asked this question on twitter that do we know which are the geographies where delta is still around do we know which are the geographies where omicron is still around do we i don't think we do sort of to say emphatically that these are the places so i think there's a lot to be sort of bettered there right even the uh, the way that I you know samples are point mona i think you know abandika made a very pertinent point i'll be a little more blunt here i think we are grossly under testing see at least 1% of the total strength is 1% should be tested for genome testing at least 1% right? i think we are just not there let's be very transparent uh, there are multiple reasons for that and i i'm going to give you the mumbai example see the point is that uh, you know we have last eighth uh, genomic sequence report we have a nanopore at kasturba hospital we have a nanopore at dj medical college which is where we picked up delta see how the delta started everybody dismissed it and it we we lost the month of february and march till we got the exposure of delta and we have that in example insacog definitely needed to upgrade its values they have done their best now we are stretched so i'll tell you how it happens we have tested in in mumbai 360 samples out of the 360 320 are omicron rest are delta derivatives only five are delta original delta and rest are others in which we still have a kappa there so it is not very very clear whether a new variant of interest or new variant of concern will come and we don't know whether it will come even who has not written this off and i don't want to send a panic here at all but from a science standpoint and from research center standpoint we need to do sufficient sampling we have excellent csir and icmr labs we definitely have lot of labs like tifr in mumbai we have nanopores in bj medical and and uh, this thing and in delhi we have igib which we have a collaboration with dr anurag agarwal's team and every from may, may, uh, may every district of maharashtra every week we send them samples to delhi in faridabad still you know they are not sufficient kerala does the same so we have some bandwidth and insight but we still don't know so the way south africa did you know if you go to middle east every patient is tested for genomic sequence we don't have that type of a high throughput in it and i still feel that we need to do some capacity building in that direction and it has it is it is to be taken in a positive spirit not in a spirit of uh, that that we don't i think we definitely need to upscale that a little more we definitely need to if needed get the private sector involved see rt pcr we had the same limitation 
at dpcr if the private sector was not uh, uh, involved we would not have reached the testing capability and capacity which we reached i still feel that if we are able to privatize the genomic testing we will be able to get a larger you know footprint and insight and at least plug that gap to 1% i am not saying more than 1% at least 1% hona chahiye 0.1% is where we are ubandika may know better numbers because she keeps a track of all this i i follow her on twitter probably but it's 0.1 0.2% which is abysmally poor maybe amrish has a dada has a point but but you know it's it's clearly we we need to be there and it's important because you know last word on 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 covid is not over still Right. We, we we will have a we will have and omicron also cannot be dismissed that lightly you see with the ba1 ba2 ba3 ba2 is something which we still don't know we, I, i mean if you ask any genome scientist they need a clinical correlation see what, what is the point of doing genomic testing in silo when we don't know what is the the clinical feature of that patient so actually now where we need genomic testing is we need genomic testing in hospitalized patients who are critical and dying and actually see what is their genome right as opposed to having all the genomic testing happening that from that is possible air. that is possible so that's one window i'm just looking at and that's what we have started doing in mumbai hospitals uh, day before yesterday in our task force we are at least trying to see from the various icu setups send these samples to the various labs available for genomic testing so we we'll get some insight from the serious or critical patients ki what is because now ultimately it's all about saving lives or serious disease amrish da you were saying something yeah i was just saying that uh, two extreme examples will tell us how genome testing helped us and how it let us down so in the first in the del not the first the delta wave uh, the indications were beginning to come but a genome testing took too long look at how fast south africa labeled omicron and spread the information across the world it took us a long time before we could say this is delta i mean there were so many queries at that point but it took us a long time our capacity wasn't there we were this time for a period of a week or 10 days delhi sent all its positive samples for genomic testing the last week of december and by by the first week of january the health minister was able to say that 85% 88% whatever are omicron and it only kept increasing so for for a short period they did all the tests and then they said now we don't have the capacity but that's all right we got the information that we wanted so this is very important to you to be used at the right time and the right numbers and a certain degree of consistency throughout is very important because this virus is a is a, is a funny virus you know it may come back in some other form and we don't know enough about about variants and this th- third important point is is to just reiterate what shashank said that all delhi sick patients their samples are being sent for genome testing we don't have all the results yet but that will be very valuable i mean the value of genome testing is only if you know what happened to the patient right you know so i think uh, we just need to scale it up i think uh, I, i think the facilities are all there i don't know what's the gap there right i think uh, throughout the pan- pandemic the, you know the the focus has been on uh, uh, sequencing samples that come from foreign travelers rather than uh, also looking at uh, you know pockets across india so i do have a lot of um, viewer questions um, kabir mahajan is asking are doctors more open to telemedicine and digital health innovations post covid 19 um, dr mithal would you like to take this Yes absolutely uh, it is something that uh, we've been talking about in all our meetings uh, shashank is here that you know endocrinology especially our specialty diabetes it lends itself to teleconsult and remote consultation etc cetera, etc cetera. but no one got down to it till 2020 and mm-hmm. then uh, some of us or many of us but some of us in particular adopted telemedicine in a big way and i think uh, for many of my patients now throughout even when the wave was down for example i continued to have 20% slots for telemedicine throughout throughout you know november december october whatever so the idea is that doctors are definitely more open but yes it is cumbersome there are many challenges and many of my colleagues have given up on it so that's also the truth so so the fact is that telemedicine is the way to go for chronic care for chronic specialties it will reduce the burden on hospitals reduce exposure of patients lot of benefits and allow access of people you know my patients from all over the country can access me now without having to make the trek through a covid infested uh, country and and they actually 
uh, it's it's very useful but i must say that there are there are barriers in that there are difficulties the practical difficulties which put many doctors away from it but as i can say for myself i have been a fairly solid convert to telemedicine right uh, dr joshi another uh, viewer question this is from sanjeev agarwal uh, he's asking technically can asymptomatic infections be called cases if yes e- uh has this been done for any other infectious disease so basically you know um when is when is it covid disease and when is when was it just an exposure to the disease and not actually uh, to the infection and not actually a disease no so i think symptoms is just a, a epiphenomenon once you harbor the virus if you have robust immunity and you don't get symptoms it only means that you have a very robust immune system or you had a low viral load but your host or yourself you handled it well and you are supposed to generate an antibody response so it is just that you got lucky and the exposure you know across india whether it is the first wave or the second wave or the third wave is going to be there so a lot of people had a little sore throat or had a little bit of flu like symptoms but they don't attribute it to symptoms per se to the disease and they recover completely so they and asymptomatics also are cases i cannot say that they are not cases but they are not of critical significance because as i said our focus or tunnel is now save every life look at the vulnerable look at people who cannot mount any immune response or have an underlying serious medical chronic condition which is where they are likely to deteriorate so we are looking at people who are likely to deteriorate for serious disease or death that's our current solitary focus so in the asymptomatic category they still are labeled as cases but the point is that the exposure is so large that you know having it and also remember that asymptomatic case still is contagious yes the invisible virus in the air is still from that asymptomatic person it's like a tip of an iceberg and this is where the community transmission which has occurred and has been dutifully acknowledged very quick and fast is is something because of this because it is the asymptomatic carriers which are really the contagious persons and that is why now we have to follow two universal precautions number one everybody around us is positive unless proven otherwise so mask appropriately number two every patient which we see is going to be positive until proven otherwise which is what we had started for hiv medicine 30 years back we have to take biosafety guidelines because your rt pcr can be only positive in 70% of the time 30% it could still be negative your rapid antigen test can only be positive in 50% of time only if your symptoms or syndrome you treat it if you don't have symptoms or syndrome you assume and also if you have to go out on the day 5 you could still or 7 you could still be harboring the virus and transmitting the virus but it is the onus on the citizen to please appropriately mask with a proper n95 or a three ply surgical mask over your cloth mask so that you don't harm your family members or your colleagues and don't keep the virus in circulation so i think the asymptomatic should not be dismissed they right. must follow some ground rules and ensure that we break the chain and it it needs citizens participation and therefore i'm grateful to people like you all who are doing this programs reaching out to audiences everybody needs to behave responsibly i think that's the need of the hour right uh, you know last uh, audience question before we close uh, shoma mighty is asking uh, is there any statistics known on the number of pregnant women getting infected by covid and the seriousness of it uh, dr mithil i i know i'm not sure if you uh, have the statistics but uh, you know from personal experience what what has uh, yes. the numbers been so so yes uh, in the delta for sure there were a lot of pregnant women infected and they actually behaved the same way as others most of us uh, most of our patients came out clean but they went went through some you know treatments etc which is very tricky during pregnancy but most of them did but some of them did go down the other way go the other way and and so i think uh, pregnancy did not confer at the moment in our experience and whatever little data we have any greater or lesser risk uh, as far as uh, covid is concerned uh, omicron of course i think as as i will just reiterate the point quickly that because people are not getting symptoms and because guidelines says cdc says 5 days 7 days i say my people conveniently forget that they need to be masked around everybody including at home for several days after that 
And that is a point that people forget. You know, once you're free, you're free. You need to have that thing on for at least 10 days from the test, maybe even 12 or whatever. You know, what we are finding with rapid antigen tests, many of our patients, older, many of our patients are older, diabetics, and they're only turning negative on day 12, day 11, like that. So there is no harm in abundant caution. Right. And masks are going to be here to stay, are, are here to stay. So please make sure that you don't just give up completely all precautions. Right. Abundika, quickly coming to you, uh, you know, I, I just want you to uh, go over what is happening in the pole bound states. What are the numbers there like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, cause any cause for worry from there? So one cause for worry that I immediately see is that Uttar Pradesh uh, testing is down 19%. Uh, and Punjab testing is down 24%. Um, this is this is as, as per the latest state bulletins. So that I think is a cause for worry. Um, vaccinations in Manipur are a cause for worry uh, because they are quite low. There's, there's quite a bit of vaccine hesitancy there. Um, uh, uh, all the pole bound states are actually on are on a vaccination deadline 31st of january they need to um, vaccinate at least with a first dose or their entire uh, eligible population so that uh, that is the status right now also i think the real change would probably happen as and when the the uh, the regulation on rallies is removed um, which is when we might possibly see the kinds of numbers if the testing is sufficient because obviously if the testing goes down like this so 24 percent is a large number uh, and and this is a weekday uh, so there's we are not talking about a weekend dip here it's a weekday so i think if if the testing goes down then anything can happen and the numbers wouldn't make much sense but right now probably the numbers uh ha there's they are seem to be in check because of the restrictions on rallies, the door-to-door -door campaigning and all that. But I'm sure at some point of time when the rallies open up, that's when the real test is going to happen. Because as we have seen multiple times, uh, Indians, uh, are, are, Indians firmly believe that nothing can happen to them. So we will not mask up. That is, that is something that's been proved throughout this pandemic. <laughs> so you need, Avantika, you knew this before the pandemic. Uh, you know that we only wear seat belts when there's a risk of getting uh, penalized. We only wear helmets on a scooter if there's a cop uh, who's right. Looking. So right. we are, we are very, uh, we are, a risk taking ability is remarkable. So <laughs> Indians are not a very safety conscious kind of society. I mean, that's the truth. Right. Absolutely. Uh, well, on, on that note, I would urge our viewers to please, please take all the uh, COVID. <laughs> related protocols seriously, because even if we are seeing a slight drop in the rate of growth of cases, uh, the, the pandemic is still very much there. It is very much circulating. People are getting infected and we do not want to be one of those unlucky ones who end up in hospitals. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mittal. Thank you, Dr. Joshi for joining us. Thank you, Abuntika for joining me. And uh, thank you viewers for sending all of your questions. We will be back every day, every weekday at uh, 6 p.m. to discuss COVID, to take all of your questions and get them answered by experts. Thank you for joining us. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.